Living Healthy with COPD. So Victor asked me to talk about COPD in the 21st century. Uh, I see he's not here. So there are some disclosures listed here. I guess some of the key ones to take a look at are we have received a fair amount of grant and contracted clinical trial support from pharmaceutical companies for, which, for whom I've done some consulting as well. And we're going to talk about several of those agents uh, as I go through the, the talk today. So I thought it would be helpful, if we're going to talk about COPD in the 21st century, we ought to go back to the 20th century and talk about COPD then. And we're going to go back to around 1986. This was uh, around the time that Dr. Bailey started the Lung Health Center here at UAB, UAB primarily to conduct the series of lung health study uh, trials. Um, <clears throat> at that same time, uh, the American Thoracic Society came out with its first really definitive guideline paper on the diagnosis and treatment uh, of patients with COPD, which they combined uh, with asthma at the time. Now, I was able to find this on microfiche and <clears throat> have uh, cut some quotes from this that I thought would be helpful to take a look at and see what people thought then and whether or not it applies to what we think today. So the first one was that three disorders are incorporated into COPD, emphysema, peripheral airways disease, and bronchitis. Of these, we only further classify emphysema. And any individual patient may have one or all of these conditions, but the dominant defining feature of COPD is always airflow limitation. So I think I would take some issue with the three disorders. We might count some others now, including some large airway abnormalities that Surya has been very involved in developing, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And I'll also show you some data that makes it quite clear that even smokers or former smokers who don't have airflow limitation have significant morbidity, significant symptoms, and I think we need to rethink our whole definition of what smoking-related uh, lung disease is. The second comment was that patients with COPD uh, may have significant reversibility and that that's really not sufficient to differentiate an individual patient as to whether they have asthma or COPD. This was a problem then, it's a problem now, despite 30 years of research showing this over and over again. I think the general consensus is people view asthma as reversible, COPD is not. It's not a sufficient tool to differentiate the two. Uh, they also go on to say that the separation of these, these two disorders is arbitrary and difficult, which I think is true. Uh, and they also say it's probably not clinically relevant. Now, I think that's probably not true. I think it is clinically relevant for a couple of reasons. Number one, these diseases carry very different prognostic implications, both for mortality, comorbid illness, and symptoms. And perhaps most importantly, and more recently, it's been important to differentiate them, at least in terms of their phenotypic characteristics, because treatments now differ very significantly, and they probably did not, or they did not in 1986. So it's been advocated that all individuals at risk be screened regularly by spirometry to de detect mild abnormalities with the rationale that severe disease might be prevented. Um, <clears throat> you may know that the US Public Health Task Force does not believe in spirometry. Many of us do believe that it's probably appropriate. Uh, the, at the time, 1986, the Lung Health Study had not been published, and, and they say the efficacy of such programs has not been demonstrated. Whether people believe it's been demonstrated now by the Lung Health Study and others is a little bit of an eye of the beholder question. I think if you look at people who were, uh, received the special intervention through the Lung Health Study, they were more likely to be alive at 14 years follow-up. That suggests to me it was effective, but there are others who still don't believe we've definitively shown that spirometry alters the natural history of the COPD component of their disease. Chest x-ray is recommended. Difficult to argue with that. I think that's probably still the case. And they recommended at the time that probably CT scanning was not indicated for most patients with COPD. I think that could still be a, a reasonable argument, but I'm going to try and make a case to you today that there are very, very more, many more patients for whom CT scanning uh, provides helpful information that's not obtainable by other means. So, when we think about the history of phenotyping, excuse me, phenotyping COPD, the natural history of the disease, everybody from medical school remembers these pictures by Frank Netter. The two extreme phenotypes of COPD, emphysematous pink puffer on the left, blue bloater, chronic bronchitic on the right. I think in general, this is still the case. There are patients that meet these criteria, but it's too simple. And these are the extremes, and there are many intermediate phenotypes between the two. And we've learned quite a bit about that over the last 30 years. This is probably the most famous curve in pulmonary medicine, the Fletcher and Pipo data. For those of you who don't know, this was really derived data 
Uh, this is not primary data that resulted in this curve, but the argument is that lung function declines as we get older from a peak at around 25, and that the decline accelerates both with age and with the severity of airflow limitation. Now, there have been a variety of studies that have challenged this of late, and I think now we can definitively say this is very much not likely to be the case for most patients with COPD. The best study that has looked at this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year by Peter Lang, uh, in which they analyzed spirometric data from three large epidemiologic cohorts, the Loveless Smokers uh, study, Framingham, uh, and the Copenhagen City, study, City Lung Study. And what they showed, they took a bunch of uh, smokers at risk for COPD but did not have airflow limitation at baseline and followed them up uh, over a period of many years. And they divided them into four groups. And the four groups are, the top two are both people who did not have COPD at baseline and did not develop obstruction over the follow-up period. The ones in green here had normal lung function. The ones in orange had reduced FEV1% predicted, though not an obstructive ratio. The bottom are the patients who did go on to develop COPD. And uh, it turns out that uh, when looked at closely, only about half of the patients who ultimately went to, on to develop COPD had evidence for accelerated lung function decline. This is uh, 53 or so mLs per year, which is the number we often quote for active smokers who are susceptible to the disease. We talk about being in the 50 to 60 mL range. And 50% of people started with normal lung function and declined to uh, meet the criteria for COPD uh, on the basis of accelerated decline. But in full, 50% of the, uh, the other 50% had low lung function at baseline and declined at a rate that was very normal compared to people who did not develop COPD. And so this very much challenges the Fletcher and Pito curve and has major implications for our understanding of the disease. In fact, there's an editorial uh, or review article in the New England Journal of Medicine today talking about uh, the early life origins of uh, COPD, which very likely begin in utero and immediately after birth. Uh, and it's important for our understanding of how we're going to shift the needle uh, in terms of the overall impact of uh, COPD across the globe. Now, this is a table from that same review article, well, excuse me, the guideline document from 1986. These were the available beta agonists, uh, epinephrine, isoproterenol, which I don't think you can make in the United States anymore, uh, terbutaline for those of you with preterm labor, uh, and that's it. No other drugs on the beta agonist class. What about anticholergics? Only atropine. Okay. So uh, things have changed a lot over those 30 years for a variety of reasons. One, uh, research investment by the NIH as well as by pharmaceutical industries, better definitions of disease, technology, et cetera. So I thought I'd take us through a history of some key events uh, in the progress in COPD. So as I said, I've cut off the time period before 1986 because nothing happened. That's an exaggeration, but of course it all started with the founding of the Lung Health Center in 1986. This is the number of PubMed citations per year between 1987 and 2015. Just to give you some historical context, 1989 the Berlin Wall fell. Um, 1998 was the master tobacco settlement. You still don't start, you're not seeing a whole lot of shift in the number of publications yet, although it does start to turn now. Uh, in 2003, we were lucky to be one of the sites, first sites into the COPD uh, research network funded by the NIH. Uh, in 2007, uh, COPD Gene was funded, which uh, has been the source of a great uh, deal of new information about the disease. Blaylock joined the division in 2009. You can see you don't really see a whole lot of initial effect there, maybe some <laughs> sloping thereafter. Uh, in 2009 or 10, Dr. Rowe decided that the CF was no longer worth it. And you see again, maybe perhaps a more of an increase. But really what changed this on a national scale was the recruitment of Dr. Bott and Dr. Wells to our division. And that's where you see the, the immediate turn up in terms of the number of publications. So this investment, uh, both by the NIH, uh, by pharma, uh, to be truthful about it, uh, has changed the uh, landscape in terms of treatment. This is the same curve showing the PubMed publications and then drug approvals. And what you see is prior to the time when I finished fellowship, there's really not much. Combivent, salmeterol, of course we had albuterol at the time. It's really been in the last three, four, or five years where there's been 
uh, a marked increase in the number of approvals. Uh, and again, I think that's a testament to the investment that's been made uh, by both the government uh, as well as pharmaceutical industry. So we're going to talk about COPD in the 21st century. We're going to touch on these issues. We're going to talk about how we define disease, particularly early disease, the natural history of early disease. We'll talk about the myth of the healthy smoker, which I've touched on a little bit already. We'll talk about where we stand in terms of phenotyping, clinical phenotyping, and then molecular phenotyping or endotyping and how that might help us treat patients. We'll talk about whether or not disease modification is possible, and along the way we'll go over some clinical trials that we've been very involved with here at UAB. We'll talk about the heterogeneity briefly of acute exacerbations. This is one of the major problems that we face is that we treat all these events as the same, both in terms of uh, how we manage them when they occur as well as their prevention, which is uh, likely a significant uh, clinical error. And then at the end, we'll talk about you know, what is the COPD moonshot. There's a cancer moonshot, there's probably others. Uh, that have received major investments, and so we need to talk about what might it be uh, for COPD. Uh, this is our own, very own Dr. Surya Bhatt, and this gentleman, I'm sure none of you know, but his name is Martin Miller, uh, and he is from the United Kingdom, and Surya and Dr. Miller are engaged in significant vitriol uh, about this issue, which for me personally sort of feels like the definition of perseveration. However, the two of them go at it about what, how we should define uh, the presence of airflow limitation. It's been the subject of a lot of uh, papers, back and forth, editorials. I think, fortunately, I'm going to make the case to you today that I think Surya is winning. Uh, I think, ultimately, it's probably a not fully solvable issue. But talking about it briefly gives you some insight to some of the other things we're going to talk about as we go through the talk. So this on the left, on the y-axis here, shows the post-bronchodilator FEV1, FBC ratio, ranging from 0.58 to 0.76. This is age along the x-axis. And the red line is the lower limit of normal of what happens to that ratio as you get older. Okay? This is the Martin Miller cutoff for what he thinks should define airflow limitation, the presence of a value below the red line. Now, the gold guidelines, which came out 15 years ago now, uh, suggested that we use the fixed ratio of 0.7, which is the black line here. So, if you're below both the red and the black line, everybody agrees, both Surya and Dr. Miller would agree that you're obstructed. If you're above the red and black line, you're also not obstructed. The question is, what do you do about the people who fall in between the these discordant groups? And this is the one that has generated the most uh, <clears throat> interest. People who meet the criteria for obstruction by being below the fixed threshold, but when compared to people of their same age, they have a value that is above the age-adjusted lower limit of normal. And what do those people look like and what happens to them over time? And the issue is, are we over-diagnosing people uh, who are older by using the fixed ratio and potentially also under-diagnosing people with airflow obstruction if we use the fixed ratio in young people for whom that might be more than 0 0.70 when it's normal? So Siri's gone on to look at this a lot of ways, and this was published a couple of years ago in Thorax, where he compared that discordant group, patients who meet, met the fixed ratio criteria for obstruction did not meet the lower limit of normal ratio for obstruction, as compared to people who met neither criteria, meaning these are theoretically uh, the healthy smoker group. And what you see, not surprisingly, based on the plot I just showed you, yes, they're a little bit older. Uh, this is data from COPD gene, but I think makes a fairly strong argument that if you're in this category, you are not a normal person in terms of your respiratory health. And though this may make sense from an epidemiologic point of view, to define it as the 5%, uh, below the 5% of age-adjusted normal, it probably doesn't capture all the patients who have or are at risk for uh, significant respiratory morbidity. So um, we looked at this issue of early disease a little bit more closely in the COPD gene study. Again, this is a paper we just published. Uh, this week, it's in press in the Blue Journal, and we looked at whether or not exacerbations in COPD affect the natural history of the disease. This has been, uh, in terms of FED1 decline, this has been somewhat of a controversial issue as to whether or not more exacerbations begot a faster decline in uh, FED1 or not. Uh, this was the first study that really had the adequate power to look at it in gold zero groups. Those are what would be considered the healthy smoker population as well as gold one patients, so those are very mild. And what we found was that as compared to patients that had no exacerbations, 
Patients in the gold one group had an excess annual decline of 23 mLs for every event that they had. Similarly, as compared to gold one patients who had no severe exacerbations, uh, gold one patients who had a severe event had 87 mLs excess decline per year for every one of those. So you could take your gold one patient, 45 year old, had two hospitalizations, you might predict based on this, that over a five year period, they would lose 160 or 174 mLs extra per year uh, on the basis of having those exacerbations. So it may be that some of our issue with our pharmacologic treatments that have shown little effect on changing FEV1 decline over time is because we focus those therapies in patients with more advanced disease in whom the damage is done and we need to move those treatments uh, more upstream. This shows the same thing visually, uh, characterizing the different gold category patients, excuse me, gold patients into uh, yes or no, they had a severe exacerbation event between their enrollment visit and their visit five years later to what happened to their FE1. And you can see that it's the gold one group in whom the uh, most obvious uh, decline was visible. So that's the gold one patient. Let's back up even further and talk about gold zero. Gold zero went away in the recent iterations of the gold guidelines, although it's likely to come back in its next iteration. Uh, these are smokers that have normal spirometry. And how are they characterized? Well. Never smokers um, in COPD gene study are shown here. This is their uh, distribution of FEV1 starting from 80% to more than 130%. You can see a uh, pretty nice bell-shaped distribution uh, across the normal range. The gold ones are shown uh, on the far right, and you see it's shifted, not surprisingly, to the left. Uh, so these are people who have obstructive ratios, but normal FEV1s, meaning they're above 80% predicted. And you can see they're clustered down here uh, below 90% for the most part. But if you look at the gold zeros, there is still this similar leftward shift. So all these people are counted as normal because their FEV1 is more than 80. But if you look, the curve for the overall population does not look like the never smokers curve. And when you look more closely at what that means in terms of physiologic <coughs> implications, you can put never smokers to gold zero patients to the gold ones who have clearly have established COPD, and you ask them or, or you uh, uh, examine them as to whether they have any of these limitations, bronchitic symptoms, more than one exacerbation, poor quality of life as measured by the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, poor exercise tolerance, significant dyspnea, meaning they have to slow down on level ground compared to the peers, more than age expected emphysema, and significant gas trapping, and count up the number of those impairments, you see that these gold zero patients are nothing like the never smokers in terms of the number of impairments that they have and their severity. In fact, they're more like the gold one patients than they are uh, like gold zero. So this has been looked at even more closely in the spiromic study, which we're also a part of here at UAB. This is a paper also from this year in the New England Journal that categorized patients who were controlled never smokers in that study versus patients with mild to moderate COPD and then this quote healthy smoker population in the middle and looked at their quality of life scores as measured by CAT. And what you can see is they're all statistically different from each other, but there are many patients in this current or former smoker group with preserved spirometry who have CAT scores that are comparable to those with uh, definitive mild to moderate COPD. They went on to then look at what happens to them over time and, and this is a, a plot showing their exacerbation frequency. And no matter how you uh, examine their exacerbation, whether you look at those that require antibiotics, steroids, both in the hospital, excuse me, in the <coughs> clinic, in the hospital, or any of them, the risk of those events is higher in the so-called healthy smokers who had elevated CAT scores as compared to people with established airflow obstruction who had low CAT scores suggesting that we're ignoring these people um, in many of the studies that we do, despite the fact that they are probably at increased risk for respiratory events than many of the people who we definitively say have mild to moderate COPD. Now, the mechanism of this is not entirely known, but it's interesting enough to the NIH that they funded uh, through the Pulmonary Trials Cooperative, which we're a part of, a trial of early bronchodilator therapy, uh, dual bronchodilator therapy in patients with uh, symptoms uh, but normal spirometry, and that will launch uh, a little bit later this year. We'll come back in a second and talk about one potential mechanism which we're very interested here in UAB, and that's mucus dysfunction uh, that won't be directly addressed uh, in the Rethink trial, but something that I think warrants 
uh, further study. And I'm going to show, show you four patients here with the exact same FEV1. These are CT scans and then micro CT scans of lung sections of a patient with central lobular dominant emphysema, panlobular emphysema, which would be the finding you would expect with alpha-1, but you don't have to have alpha-1 to see panlobular emphysema, and paraseptal emphysema. You can see marked difference not only in the CT appearance, but also in the micro CT. This is a patient that has some airway thickening, but really no emphysema. Every one of those has an FEV1 in the mid-50s. And so I just don't think it has any face validity to anyone other than people who have been uh, engaged in the confusion of COPD that these are the same. Show this to a lay person on the street, this is not the same illness, and yet we've been treating it the same for uh, 30 years, and it's only been recently that we've moved beyond that. So <clears throat> how should we do this better? Well, this is, a, for those of you who haven't read this or seen this, this is an excellent uh, editorial comment by Steve Bernard and Jorgen Vespo talking about how COPD or the subtypes of COPD should each be considered uh, orphan diseases. Uh, obviously, that's a somewhat extreme view uh, and likely never meet the true characteristic two criteria for orphan diseases, but it is probably naive that we lump all these people into one basket and treat them the same and then are surprised when our therapies are only modestly effective. So how can we do better? Well, CT is one way. This is something that uh, has been around or developed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. I call this basic CT phenotyping. And what you see here are uh, 3D plots of emphysema uh, on, on the axis here to the left, wall thickness of the airway on the axis here to the right, and uh, this plot showing the risk of exacerbation. And what you see is really the airway wall thickness and the emphysema seem to have independent uh, effects on exacerbation risk. You get similar plots uh, with quality of life scores. Again, the um, emphysema shown on this axis. The PI-10, which is an alternative me measure uh, of airway wall disease. Uh, and again, those two also seem to correlate well, but independently with the Bode uh, index of overall COPD severity. Uh, again, this has been around for a long time, and I think it adds somewhat to our understanding of the disease, but it's limited for a lot of reasons. One of the major reasons is it doesn't provide us an adequate measurement of small airways disease, which we know is one of the early features of smoking-related lung disease and likely precedes the development of emphysema. So <clears throat> Surrey published a paper earlier this year in the Blue Journal using what I call uh, advanced CT phenotyping or image registration and PRM or parametric response mapping in which uh, each scan, each voxel is mapped from inspiration and expiration. And using that technique, they can differentiate emphysematous lung from lung that is uh, trapping gas on the basis of what we call functional small airways disease. And what you see is as you increase COPD severity, not surprisingly, the amount of normal lung goes down, the amount of emphysema goes up. And the peak of small airway abnormality appears somewhere here in the middle. Surya went on to show that early in disease, it's really the FSAT or functional small airway disease that predicts uh, lung function decline. But this is a much more precise tool to differentiate patients into what is their primarily lung, primary, primary lung pathology and how that might help us uh, select therapies. What's even more uh, exciting, I think, is work that he's now doing with Sandeep uh, Baudelaire, who is in the back row next to Surya, for those of you who don't know him, that use similar techniques to, again, map voxel to voxel what happens uh, to a single lung unit between inspiration and expiration. And what you see here is the amount of uh, lung volume change from a great deal of lung volume change to very little in a gold uh, one patient and a gold four patient. And this is an extreme example, but what you see is significant volume expansion or volume change in the gold one and very little movement uh, in the gold four. And these kind of techniques will allow us, I think, to identify why patients within a given goal category may or may not be responding to treatments that we've tried or may or may not be uh, candidates for other ones that are in development. Again, this is an extreme example, but if I were to show you multiple gold one patients with similar FEV1s, you'll see a heat map that looks very different and therefore uh, could be used perhaps to uh, better target uh, uh, pharmacology. So, uh, CT phenotyping has been done for a variety of other things as well to subtype the disease. Mike Wells, I think most people know, has really led the way in terms of phenotyping the vascular disease. He initially showed that this very simple measure of the pulmonary artery diameter to that of the aorta 
uh, was not only reproducible, easy to do, you didn't have to have sophisticated CT scans, but predicted the risk of exacerbation better than any of the previous uh, tools that have been used, including uh, a history of exacerbation, which uh, was touted to be the best uh, predictor of those events. He then went on to show that people with enlarged pulmonary uh, ratios uh, had peripheral pruning uh, of their pulmonary vasculature that was associated with this dilatation of their pulmonary artery, as well as associated with subclinical but MRI, cardiac MRI detectable right ventricular dysfunction that had significant uh, correlations with uh, morbidity. And then most recently, he went on to show that in hospitalized patients, if you use both their serum troponin levels and whether or not they had an elevated uh, pulmonary artery to aorta ratio at baseline, uh, you could predict with some uh, accuracy whether or not they were going to do poorly in terms of the need for ICU care, death, or uh, uh, ventilatory support. As I mentioned earlier, this issue about large airways disease has been controversial uh, for many years as to whether people who have what used to be called tracheobronchomalacia had symptoms as a result of that or whether this was just a chance finding that had nothing to do uh, with their symptomatology. So, Surrey again used the COPD gene data in a very complicated and well done study uh, to show that patients who had expiratory collapse of their uh, trachea of more than 50% had worse quality of life, more dyspnea, and a higher risk of exacerbations, two to three fold increase in all of those as compared to patients who did not have collapse of their tracheal tree or tracheobronchial tree even after correction for everything else that you would be interested in, including other predictors of, of respiratory morbidity. So he's going to go on to show, we hope, or to determine perhaps what the uh, biologic and genetic mechanisms that might underpin this and eventually perhaps <clears throat> work towards therapy. So I mentioned earlier, that's phenotyping. And so then what's endotyping? Well, endotyping is really applying a molecular mechanism to a, a phenotypic characteristic. And this is data from, again, from Prescott Woodruff's group at UCLA uh, using a tool they had developed in asthma, which was an epithelial gene expression score that measured the degree of TH2, or asthma-like uh, inflammation that was in the airway, and applied it to a COPD population. He applied it to, a co to three separate cohorts of COPD studies in which they had epithelial brushings available. And what he showed was that, that TF TH2 expression score shown on the y-axis here correlated inversely with baseline lung function regardless of whether you are a smoker or not. It also correlated with some features of, of asthma, including, uh, in this case, uh, serum eosinophil levels, and in fact also correlated uh, with a reduction in air trapping as measured by the change in residual volume compared to TLC when treated with inhaled steroids. So again, this was a tool from an asthmatic patient or developed in asthmatic patients that he used to show that in COPD, these gene expression uh, features were associated with a more asthmatic phenotype and a better response to inhaled steroids. They've since gone on to show that a high IL-17 genetic signature, which is associated with neutrophilia, predicted a very poor ICS response, and hopefully that paper will be out soon. What about the clinically easy way to perhaps do some of this endotyping. Well, one thing that has come from that and was in development even, even before that was the use of blood eosinophils as a way to predict responders to inhaled corticosteroids. This is data from one of the Glaxo development programs that looked at the combination of what now is the, the marketed product Brio, the combination of fluticasone furoate and the beta agonist philanterol. And what you see is as the eosinophil count rises, the benefit of adding the inhaled steroid to the long-acting beta agonist in terms of exacerbation prevention becomes more clear. In those that have eosinophil counts below 2%, there really is no additional value of adding an ICS. And I think this is probably immediately useful for us, that if and we're doing this in our clinics already, if you see people that have not had recent exacerbations, they have low eosinophil counts, there's really not a reason to continue them on ICS therapy for the idea that you're going to prevent one of these events in the future. Similarly, we know from the Isoldi trial, which is the study I'm showing two plots from here, that inhaled corticosteroids do not appear to modulate FEV1 decline over time in all comers with COPD. But as this data about eosinophils become, became more uh, well recognized, investigators went back and looked at FEV1 decline 
uh, in patients treated with steroids versus treated with placebo in these two subgroups. Less eosinophils in the periphery, less than 2% versus greater than or equal to 2%. And what you can see in the low eosinophil group, there really is no difference in rate of decline, similar to the overall study population. But if you look in those that had a high baseline level of eosinophils, there's preservation or relative preservation of the FB1 in those treated with ICS and the expected decline uh, in those treated with placebo. So this has not been shown prospectively yet, but fairly convincing data. Um, uh, this is going to be a clinically useful tool. And again, I, as I mentioned, we're already using it ourselves. So ultimately though, um, if you look over the last 20 years, the benefits of, uh, even though we've approved many, many drugs, the uh, incremental benefit of adding additional bronchodilators uh, has come down with time. So if you look at the original Combiment studies that were published uh, in the late 90s, you see very big improvements in FMV1. And as you layer in more therapies, you get a diminishing benefit on FE1 as if you're reaching a ceiling effect. Sort of comparable to cardiovascular disease where you give somebody an aspirin and they do much better after myocardial infarction. And then in order to show that lytics work, you had to enroll more people. And then in order to show that G2B3A inhibitors work, you gotta go enroll more people and you're detecting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller benefits. But we're seeing sort of the same thing. And ultimately, I believe that that those approaches are going to be limited. And they're limited by a variety of factors. But this one is probably the most important in my mind. And that is that over the course of progressive airways disease in COPD, the amount of remodeling that occurs becomes so severe in these later stages, it's not going to respond <coughs> to these bronchodilatory medications. When they used uh, computer uh, uh, algorithms to maximally bronchodilate that airway, um, as best as could be uh, achieved with any, or better than could be achieved with any pharmacologic agent, they found that a significant luminal obstruction was still present uh, due to mucus. And when that was quantified from the smallest amount to the greatest amount of luminal mucus um, occluding the airway, you see a clear relationship with mortality over time. And so targeting this residual airway occlusion is something that I think we're going to have to, one potential way that we could to modify disease. And that's something that we've been very interested in here in UAB. This is again data from uh, the spiromic study showing that if you compare that group that I talked about, this is the so-called healthy smokers, healthy smokers with no symptoms to healthy smokers who do have symptoms or the elevated CAT score, you see that their sputum mucin content was higher in those that had symptoms. We also know that the amount of mucin per volume of sputum increases with COPD severity as measured by FED1. It increases with exacerbation frequency, and it increases in the presence of chronic bronchitis, whether, whether or not you have emphysema. And so in collaboration with, with Steve and CF Center, uh, we've <coughs> had a long interest in the possibility that CFDR dysfunction was one mechanism by which this <coughs> uh, mucus dysfunction could lead not only to uh, residual obstruction of the airways, uh, but to symptoms. And so Marty uh, published this paper, this pilot study in Lancet Respiratory Medicine this year, looking at Ivacaftor. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a CFTR uh, <clears throat> activator in patients who had chronic bronchitis. I'll just show you some uh, brief results from that. This is their change in sweat chloride. Patients who are assigned to placebo versus Ivacaftor, you see a uh, decline in sweat chloride in those on the active treatment group. This is their change in <clears throat> nasal potential difference. And again, you see improvements from baseline in the Ivacaftor group. And when you look at symptoms, here we use the breathlessness, cough, and sputum scale. None of these are statistically significant, but you see over the 14-day treatment period and then a washout period here that people assigned to Ivacaftor had uh, improvements, excuse me, improvements in their BCSS scores as compared to those who were treated with placebo. And so Steve and I now uh, have funding and are going to go forward to do a larger phase two trial of this, <clears throat> looking uh, for an extended period of time uh, in more patients to see if we can target uh, the specific endotype. What about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction? So many people know that lung volume reduction surgery, despite the fact in the United States there were less than 100 surgeries performed last year, uh, at least by paid for by Medicare, and in the appropriately selected patients, it's one of the few things that improves mortality, and that's been proven in a large randomized trial published in the early 2000s. The problem is that the upfront risk of morbidity is not insignificant, and many patients and providers are not 
uh, enthusiastic about this procedure. So we and others have been looking at a variety of non-invasive techniques to do that. One of those uh, is endobronchial coils, which are shown on this x-ray. Some of you who are roaming around the hospital may see people with these in. There's a decent number that we've placed here at UAB. We, this is published in JAMA this year and showed that as compared to patients who were not treated with coils, as shown on the right, uh, people who were treated with coils had a general trend towards improvement in FEV1. The, the actual value here in the overall population was an 8% improvement in FEV1, which is not dismissible in patients with very se severe COPD. Although you'll see, again, this shows how much improvement uh, in the two groups. You see there's sort of a wide variation. And I think this whole approach is also limited by the same things that have limits our pharmacologic treatments in that the definition for who gets into these trials is also very much based uh, on FEV1, the degree of air trapping, other markers of pulmonary function, but does not specifically uh, require a unique understanding or a better understanding of the unit to unit change that's occurring uh, in the patient's lung. And so we think that some of the techniques that Sandeep and, and Surya are working on uh, could help with us with that. The other endpoints that were looked at included quality of life and the six minute walk. And again, you sort of see this uh, general improvement in those who got coils. This will go to the FDA later this year uh, for consideration. I think it's up in the air as to whether or not they're going to improve it. Uh, we, we shall see. Uh, another one that we looked at is bronchoscopic lumbar reduction with an uh, airway sealant. Uh, this is a before and after showing the fissure location on the right and the left, and then after a sclerosis is injected in the right upper lobe and left upper lobe, you see scarring in both those areas, the shifting of the uh, fissure upward. And when looked at uh, in aggregate, this is, this is patient to patient changes. Individual patients here that are changing FEV1 at six months. You see again, you some people who don't do well with the loss of FEV1, but you see some people with unbelievable improvements. This guy here was a UAV patient with an 80% improvement in FEV1. Problem is that if you look at toxicity, this is uh, significant adverse events related to the procedure. Um, much higher in those who got the therapy as to control patients uh, shown here on the right for whom there really wasn't a lot of change in FEV1 either. Uh, same story with valves. Valves are uh, wrapping up the pivotal trial of valves in the United States now and hopefully we'll be able to show that in patients uh, who do not have collateral ventilation, this is the technique that we use to show in the bronchoscopy suite, that there is no connection between a target lobe where you put valves and the adjacent lobe, which actually is uncommon in humans. Most humans do not have completely separated lobe. But if they do have separated lobe, the curve looks like that. And in this paper published last year in the New England Journal, patients who had valves and had complete fissures, no evidence for interlobar ventilation, they had a marked improvement in FEV1 compared to control. So this will wrap up this year and hopefully go to, hopefully show uh, benefits. What about beyond FEV1? Well, I think this is where we need to move. Unfortunately, the FDA is still very focused, in some ways rightly so, on FEV1 exacerbations and mortality, but as I mentioned, it's getting harder and harder to show an FEV1 benefit. Everybody's probably familiar with this pathway of how angiotensinogen converts to angiotensin II. In addition to its role in modulating uh, blood pressure, it also leads to um, a marked increase in inflammatory markers, IL-6, CRP, and TGF beta being amongst the most important. Animal models of a mouse that's deficient in fibrillin, which has a problem with alveolar septation, in which it's also believed that that's due to excess TGF beta signaling, have been studied in the presence and absence of losartan, which was an angiotensin II uh, blocker or an AR blocker. And what you see is, uh, as compared to the fibrillin deficient uh, mice treated with placebo, those treated with losartan had preservation of their emphysematous architecture over the, over the uh, uh, exposure period. Same thing in a mouse model, this is from uh, Enid Neptune's group at Johns Hopkins, they showed that as compared to mice treated with room, exposed to room air, those who are exposed to cigarette smoke had more emphysema that was blunted uh, in the presence of low sartan. Uh, that was associated with the normalization of their TGF beta, uh, re reduction in the airspace enlargement, and a near normalization of their total lung capacity. This was <coughs> then the fodder or the preliminary data was used for a small phase two trial of uh, low sartan. 
in patients with emphysema and over a 12 year period, you can see that patients treated with low sartan had relative preservation of their emphysema as compared to baseline, whereas patients treated with placebo had progression over that one year period. And that was, of course, in not unexpectedly not associated with a change in FEV1, which again is gonna be a recurring theme, I think, as we move forward with new drug development is therapies that might alter the natural history of disease, might truly deal with repair issues, uh, don't have any major effect on lung function, at least in the short term. So this is another trial that's about to start here at UAB, again, sponsored by the NLHLBI Pulmonary Trials Cooperative, looking at a longer term study of, of low sartan. So what about repairing emphysema? Well, <clears throat> this is, um, I'm not a laboratory guy, so those of you who are, I apologize for the dumbed down version of what's happening here, but uh, we know that fibroblasts are very important uh, uh, for repair, wound healing in general, and we think also important for the maintenance uh, of lung tissue and the prevention of the development of emphysema. That's developed, that's dependent on these uh, repair processes, proliferation, chemotaxis of uh, fibroblasts and production of collagen. When in the setting of, of inflammation in the lung, there's a marked increase in a variety of markers, one of which is PGE, or prostaglandin E. And we know that PGE uh, inhibits uh, fibroblast activity, inhibits these repair processes. It also, as it happens, leads to senescence of the fibroblast and can lead to elaboration of ILA. And so a question becomes whether or not we can manipulate this pathway. As you all know, there are drugs that can interfere with PGE levels, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and whether or not that might help us with repair of emphysema. So re repair function in patients with COPD, whether measured by hemotaxis to fibronectin or the contraction of gel, uh, is poor uh, as the disease uh, worsens. It's also worse in general in COPD patients than controls. This shows the hemotactic potential in gold zero, two, three, and four <coughs> patients declining. And then how much gel contraction occurs, you can see very little uh, in patients with gold 4 COPD, suggesting their fibroblast repair function is uh, markedly inhibited. When you give uh, these fibroblasts into methicin, which is a, obviously one mechanism to block PGE signaling, um, you see improvements uh, in gel contraction and hemotaxis to fibronectin. And these changes, although I'm not showing it here, are associated with declines in PGE levels. And so, the AML data led to a closer look at data from the Eclipse study, and obviously this is fairly uncontrolled and preliminary information, but it suggests that chronic or habitual users of ibuprofen or other NSAIDs had higher mean lung density, at least in the lower lobes, uh, as compared to non-users. And this was used to set the stage for this trial, which is ongoing here at UV, looking at a one-year uh, treatment uh, course of ibuprofen versus placebo. The primary endpoint are bronchoscopic levels of PGE, but we'll also be looking at uh, CT parameters. So I said I mentioned something briefly about exacerbation heterogeneity. As those of you who are treating these people clinically, you know we do exactly the same thing in every single patient every single time, which is steroids, antibiotics, bronchodilators, that's about it. We know that not all these events are triggered by the same thing. Uh, some bacterial, some viral, but we know cardiac disease contributes to some. Uh, there may be many other triggers. This was a paper published a few years ago in the Blue Journal in which they used the cluster analysis to <clears throat> separate these into uh, different types of exacerbation based on their inflammatory profile. So cluster number one had marked increase in neutrophils, but not much going on in terms of Th1 or Th2 inflammation, suggesting a bacterial process. Cluster two was a high Th2 event, suggesting perhaps this is allergic. Cluster three was a high Th1 event, so perhaps viral. And then cluster four was completely policy inflammatory. No evidence for systemic or pulmonary inflammation, um, suggesting it was not at all related to the typical uh, respiratory events that we think of as causing exacerbations. And so we can think about, well, maybe these would be targeted or prevented by different strategies, perhaps azithromycin or reflumolase for these, perhaps inhaled steroids or anti-IL-5, which everybody probably is aware now are in development for the uh, allergic episodes, antivirals, there aren't many, of course, for these episodes, and then some cardiovascular, perhaps, management for people who are having these policy inflammatory events. We know that cardiovascular dysfunction is very common <coughs> during COPD exacerbations. <clears throat> if you have an elevated uh, BNP level, you have an odds ratio of mortality of nine at 30 days, and about a quarter of people will have that when looked at prospectively. If you have an elevated troponin level, your odds ratio of death is uh, six, <laughs> Uh, and about 20% of people 
Uh, some studies suggest as high as 70% will have an elevated troponin at the time of their exacerbation. And there's a clear increase uh, between having normal values for both, uh, either value being positive or both being positive in terms of overall mortality. We know outpatients who have exacerbations also have an increase in cardiac injury. These are troponin levels measured over from stable state to exacerbation in the subsequent month. And you can see in people who do have ischemic heart disease and don't, you still see <coughs> detectable increases in their serum troponin levels, suggesting that even outpatients for whom we give Medrol, Dosepak, and ZPAC, uh, many of them are having subclinical cardiac ischemia during that time. There's a lot of interest in how available inhaled therapies might prevent uh, these cardiac-driven <laughs> Uh, exacerbations. This is data from the large TORCH study, which was published in 2007 that compared Advair to its component parts and placebo. Showed no effect on overall mortality, but there was a suggestion that the combination arm of salmeterol and fluticasone reduced the cumulative risk of cardiovascular events over the follow-up period. That then led to a study called Summit, which was published this year in The Lancet, that tested that prospectively and enrolled patients at very high risk or higher risk for cardiovascular disease uh, similarly looked at ICS lava, ICS lava versus placebo. Very large study, the largest study in the history of pulmonary medicine, showing no difference uh, in overall mortality, suggesting that perhaps the inhaled route is not the way to go. <clears throat> and maybe the concept, the inhaled steroids or lung active beta agonists may not be uh, a way to address the cardiovascular component of exacerbation. We've been very interested in this for some time, looking at cardiovascular medications as a way to treat COPD. This is a paper from 2006 showing that ACE inhibitors, ARBs, statins, and their combination reduce the risk of hospitalization for COPD, but also reduce the risk, not unexpectedly, of myocardial infarction or death. And so the question becomes, uh, can any of those be used prospectively, cardiac medications used prospectively and proven to prevent uh, exacerbations? We did the Simvastatin trial uh, here as part of the COPD network. That did not work, uh, suggesting no independent effect of Simvastatin on uh, cardiovascular, excuse me, on exacerbation risk. We've then been very interested in beta blockers, a potential way uh, to address this. Surrey's used COPD and JN data to show in a variety of ways, no matter how you look at it, the risk of exacerbation, whether any or severe, is lower with beta blockers in patients who get beta blockers, patients who do not. Um, <clears throat> There's one study out there actually from Scandinavia that shows the exact opposite, which is the risk of, uh, of death is higher in those who get beta blockers. And so that set the stage for us to do what's ongoing now, the Department of Defense block COPD protocol, which is a, a one-year study of metoclol versus placebo on the risk of exacerbation. So what, I'll just wrap up with what the COPD moonshot is. Uh, is it stem cell treatments? I, I don't know if people in clinic have been asked about this. I certainly have, and people go. It's about $10,000. Different ways they do it. Um, <clears throat> I've not really been seen any harm. I'm not sure it's doing anything. The NIH program in terms of development of stem cells for clinical use is a long way away. Uh, and probably, I don't know whether it'll ever be uh, clinically viable, but it's certainly not today. Um, this was a, an article published on AL.com uh, by Alan Bloom, who's a family practitioner here in Alabama, who feels very strongly that the moonshot for cancer, in this case, uh, is already well known, uh, which is that we should eliminate cigarette smoking, which of course is the truth. Is the truth. We should do that. Even if we were to do that, the number of people with end-stage COPD from non-cigarette smoking causes would still uh, be a public health burden, so that will not solve all of our problems, although certainly uh, it is one way to get it done. I think one of the best ways is funding. I think we've already talked about the fact that both pharma and the NIH have invested significantly more over the past 30 years in COPD, although it's still woefully inadequate. This is a plot that shows the amount of money spent by the federal government through the NIH per death for a variety of diseases. COPD, not surprisingly, sits right here at the very end of the curve. I've taken the liberty of removing uh, malaria, which is number two, and number one is temporomandibular joint dysfunction. One death in the United States, uh, something like three and a half million dollars uh, of funding. Anyway, so if you cut off more of these top ones, like <coughs> HIV, tuberculosis, West Nile, cystic fibrosis, apologies to the CF group, and you start with asthma, you still see, it's only now you can start to see a blip uh, related to COPD. So more money, I think, would help. Uh, the last thing is that uh, this has got to be a multi-provider, multi-stakeholder process. 
to address the burden of COPD. This is a paper we published in the Lancet Respiratory Earlier this year, emphasizing the need to involve more than just pulmonologists in this public health problem. We have to involve primary care people, respiratory therapy, nurses, rehab, other subspecialists if we're going to, as well as payers, et cetera, if we're ever going to make a dent. So,